What's going on, everybody? This is The Burn Down. Today's guest is here to talk to you about the latest and greatest in the tobacco industry. And that person is Joshua Haberski, head of government relations for the PCA, Premium Cigar Association. Coming up next on The Burn Down. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to The Burn Down. I'm Justin. I'm Eric. If you're new to this channel, please hit the like button, please hit the subscribe button, and smash that bell to be notified for whenever we drop new videos. If you're listening to the podcast, whatever platform you're on, please just give us a five-star rating, five thumbs up, leave a comment, subscribe. It really helps us out with the algorithm. Leave, leave something good. Just leave us something nice. Yeah. <laughs> so now we got that out of the way, our guest for you today is here to talk about all the latest and greatest from the tobacco industry as a whole. I mean, what us cigar smokers can look forward to, some mm -hmm. of the things that we've overcome in the past. I mean, a lot of good stuff coming on this show. And uh, there's no better person who has boots on the ground than someone who's called the head of government relations for the PCA, which is the Premium Cigar Association. And that man, he's Joshua Haberski. What's going on, brother? Guys, great to be with you. I'm so excited for the conversation. I've been looking forward to this all week and, uh, you know, enjoy some cigars and good conversation with you both. Absolutely, man. We're, uh, we're pretty intrigued to get to know you and to understand what the heck you do because <laughs> I see you traveling here and there. I see you putting up all this stuff about cigars. And I'm like, man, how come I do this? What does this guy do? This seems super interesting. So, uh, yeah, man, we're super excited. So thank you for being on. Thank you. So before we dive into this, like we do with every episode, every time. we got to spark it up. We got to pour it out. So let's talk about what we're smoking. I see that I, before we started this, you were smoking something. I saw it. So I want to find out what are you smoking today? So this is actually a private label, one that I worked on when I was in Nicaragua. I'm producing 3,000 of these alongside Ace Prime and Pichardo. And um, this will be a gift cigar that we give to folks in the cigar industry or in the political industry. Um, and it's a blend that I've, I've been working with Luciano uh, since October and gave all of my palate preferences, size. It's meant to be, it's 52 ring gauge, meant to be a presentation style cigar, but we don't even have the bands ready yet. Um, it, it, we're going to have the, the release in the coming months and the, what it's actually called. I've been previewing it a little bit and each, each conversation that I have, I reveal a little bit more, uh, <laughs> but it is, it is a good cigar and I look forward to sharing them with uh, both of you. Well, we appreciate that. We know exactly how you feel because we're in the same, yep. <laughs> we're probably in the same uh, spot in our journey as you with creating the cigar got tasting it don't have any clue what the band's gonna look like got the size like one step at a time baby steps <laughs> so because yeah. it's hard to taste a cigar it's hard enough to think of a name for a cigar it's hard enough to think of what it looks like for the band so taking one step at a time so what i have today and i did it in 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 uh accordance to you because i knew you were just in nicaragua so this is my first time having this this is the tabernacle uh the wise man which i believe is a nicaraguan puro um, I know Justin has had it. He says it's silky smooth. So yeah. I looked in the humidor. I said, you know, it's made in Nicaragua. Josh was just there. I think it's time to uh, to spark it up. So this is what I'll be having today. I'm excited. A good stick for sure. Yeah, I remember that stick being uh, almost velvety. Yeah, like, that's what like you said. it's not. You know, it's not really too many oils present, but I feel like it's it's still just a a very rich smoke. Good so. Stuff. What I got today is, uh, I believe this is courtesy of Luxury Cigar Club. Yep. Uh, shout out to them. This is Casa Cuevas, the Edición Limitada. This is the Maduro Flaco. So this is not quite a Lancero. It's, it's almost It's a little there. bit thicker than a Lancero, but you can call it a Lonsdale. Yeah, it's nice. Um, had this one in the past, loved it. So we're going to smoke that one today. And are you drinking? That is the next question. Do you drink? So I'm drinking black coffee with my uh, Washington, D.C. mug. I'm in the PCA office here, literally like three blocks from the Capitol. And wow. I've been working on legislation uh, this afternoon. So I am not enjoying an adult beverage currently. But if I were, I would probably have a diplomatico <laughs> rum. 
Oh, nice. a rum guy. Okay. I, you might be the first rum drinker on the podcast. Yeah, I haven't heard, we haven't heard that yet as a recommendation. What, what grows together goes together. That's what a lot of the cigar manufacturers have told me. I didn't, I originally wasn't a rum drinker. I preferred tequila, but uh, ever since having this job after uh, two years, I've been drinking more and more rum. Florida Cana and Nicaraguan rum. I'm a big fan of that. Had a lot of it when I was in Nicaragua. <laughs> Generally, tequila, my side hustle, so to speak. Uh, I own two uh, taco and tequila bars here in Virginia. So uh, that uh, that's why I have a, a finite love for, for tequila. Awesome. Well, I certainly love tequila. I know you've yeah. had quite a few experiences with tequila. <laughs> One or two. One or two, maybe. Um, but yeah, a lot, not, not many people know or would think that tequila goes well with cigars. I mean, I, I certainly wait. didn't when I started. Uh, and obviously, there's certain types of tequila, right? Like extra añejo and the añejo is more of the sipping tequila. Probably goes with cigars rather than blanco or reposado. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but anyway, let's. Uh, we're drinking one of our favorites, which is Eagle Rare, um, one of our absolute favorite. A bourbons. new favorite, a new favorite that we came across. Um, do you do you like whiskey? Do you like bourbon? I do, I do. We uh, I drink a lot of it, steaks, cigars, and a little bit of bourbon. I, I, that's a good combination. Most definitely. Can't go be, can't beat that. So while we pour this out and we light up our cigars, yeah, let's do it. We got to ask you the first question. What the hell do you do? What as, do you do as head of government relations? What do you do? For the PCA. What the hell do you do? Please dive into Please it. Please explain this the to us. The floor is yours, my friend. Absolutely. So I serve as the chief lobbyist for the Premium Cigar Association. Uh, we represent the 3,000 plus retailer, retailers and lounges across the country in the United States. Um, so I advocate for the stores. I advocate and lobby in Congress with the Food and Drug Administration, uh, as well as in the states. So, uh, you know, as a head of government relations, I work with our state team, ensuring that there isn't any negative laws or regulations that um, harm the legal purchase of, of legal adult products uh, of premium cigars and pipe tobacco. So we also represent pipe tobacco. Um, and uh, in that, you know, I also do a lot of the public affairs side and advance the industry. We want to make sure show you know the economic um, impacts and the small businesses and the jobs that are at stake in the premium cigar side, as well as advocate for for consumers and uh, you know folks such as yourselves, so that you can continue to do what you love and enjoy in your pastime and passion, much like mine. I started as a a consumer, you know, a decade ago enjoying cigars. And I have my dream job because I get to enjoy it and share the stories and the insider stories of premium cigars with uh, other other folks and other consumers. Wow. Now, like, what did you go to school for? Like, what do you, who goes to school for tobacco? You know, how does, how does one get into that? So, you know, I started lobbying actually for the American Motorcyclist Association. So completely different area, um, you know, on highway, off highway motorcycles, and then did a brief stint with the Diabetes Association in the public health space. And then most recently before coming to PCA about two years ago, I spent three and a half years lobbying for community banks in the financial services sector. So I went to Georgetown, uh, and got a master's in American government and understand the policy side. Um, I always had a background in grassroots uh, lobbying and getting people in, in excited and writing to their members of Congress and talking to elected officials. So before I started at PCA full time, I built a website called cigaraction.org for the association. And you can go there write to members of Congress, find out about what's affecting your state um, and, and some of the challenges and opportunities that we face from a government relations perspective. So that, um, that tool, we kind of built upon that. And when the role came up to lead federal affairs, um, I knew I wanted to get my dream job, kind of combine my expertise with my passion. Um, and I lobbied, I think the, the most I've lobbied for was this job. 
<laughs> it, it, it really truly is a blessing and I enjoy every day. We have a great team, a great board of directors, great executive director, and I've got to learn a lot, interact with the, the top names in the industry and learn from them. So, you know, in the experience side of things, I've also, um, you know, taken the uh, tobacconist certification, um, you know, went to Nicaragua, have done DR, different trips there, have gone to Tampa in the J.C. Newman factory and really studied all of the supply chain and all about cigars uh, to kind of marry the two expertise of lobbying and, and premium cigars together. So you, so you basically make sure that people don't fuck with our industry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Absolutely. For lack of a better term, you make sure that people don't shit on our industry so we can continue to do what we got to do. <laughs> yes. So, Damn, that that's that's pretty that's pretty awesome actually i mean it, so he's it does, the guy like he's you, the you're guy the, you're the guy <laughs> so when something <laughs> shitty happens we know who to come to yeah well we're fighting a lot of stuff you guys are, are based in new york right yes, yeah well correct. so one of the things we want to ask you is what the hell is going on with 100 percent tax in new york what's going on with that <laughs> yeah, yeah so we're, we're fighting that uh currently you know the they want to increase it to 129 percent um you know we've talk with the governor's office and a lot of the state elected officials there. And we think that we have a good shot at beating it. We're going to have, you know, uh, some different campaigns. That's going to be one that we'll launch on cigar action where you guys can write to your elected officials, send a pre-written message saying, Hey, don't mess with the premium cigar industry. It affects a lot of jobs. It affects small businesses that are recovering from coronavirus. Um, so, you know, in New York, there's, there's a lot of stuff. I, I would say California and New York are the most challenging states to operate uh, tobacco business in currently. Um, we had another bill in New York that would basically require retailers to have a minimum uh, manufacturers and retailers to sell premium cigars with a minimum package amount. So you would only be able to buy five cigars at a time. And as you guys know, much like myself, I go to a shop and buy one of this brand and one of this brand and one of that mm -hmm. brand and try new stuff. To me, that, you know, why are you going to regulate single cigars out of existence? That doesn't make any sense. So we're pushing back against that as well. So what does it take? So like, you know, government officials, you know, the governor of New York, governor of California, like, do they even like take a look at cigars or do they just kind of just bundle it in with everything else underneath tobacco? Is so that like type that's, of fight? I think that's the largest part of, of my job and the most time is educating policymakers on what premium cigars are and what they're not and how they relate to, you know, any of the other tobacco products. So, you know, this differentiating ourselves from vaping and e-cigarettes, um, you know, the flavors issue, machine made issue, um, mm. as well as, you know, age of purchase. Those are some big things that come up all along the way. But, you know, we've been doing aggressive education campaigns here in Washington, D.C. In Congress, we did last year uh, 150 meetings, even uh, in spite of coronavirus. We did 350 uh, meetings the year before in person. We do events. Uh, at our townhouse here, which is the first floor, and I hope you guys have the opportunity to visit sometime, is uh, a smoking lounge where we will have uh, elected officials as well as staff come and learn about cigars. So we've shown the documentary Hand Roll. We did style and cigars with Michael Herklotz, um, combining different things. So, you know, we want to do it from not necessarily the hard politics lens, but about cigars and then a little bit about the challenges that we face from a government affairs perspective so that people gain a better understanding and they'll be willing to go out on the line and say, you know what, this is worth defending, not because I just enjoy it and it's a great social tool that I, I, I share with my friends, but it's also at the end of the day, 300 people touch a premium cigar before we all purchase it. There's a lot of jobs at stake. There's a lot of livelihoods at stake here in the United States with all the small businesses, but in the DR, Honduras, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of jobs yeah. in areas that where there's a lot of poverty. And without this, 
it would be significantly worse. Mm, wow. Yeah, that's a good point. It's, you know, I, I feel like some people group premium cigars with all tobacco products, and it's completely not, they're not the same. I mean, no doubt. I've said it right off the, right off the bat as people say, oh, you know, that's, you know, you're smoking, uh, or cigarettes and cigars, same shit. I go, no, it's completely different. Like, and right off, just the smell, cigarettes smell is completely different than cigar smell. Um, but to your point is that this is, you know, this is, a piece there's, of art. There, yeah, there's a, a work of art. There's so many people involved in this, whereas cigarettes are machine made. They print, they do thousands, of, hundreds of thousands of them automated. Terrible chemicals. And one person pushes a button and they spit out a hundred thousand, whereas these are hand rolled it's grow it's it's almost like wine it's a work of art it's every season they have to grow yeah. they have to harvest they have to they have to let them age they have to roll them like there's a whole process as opposed to just throwing pencil shavings into a little stick i, I hear that yeah this is you know whole leaf tobacco vegetable gum and water those are three ingredients to a premium cigar that's it they're a work of art as you mentioned i mean look at the boxes behind you the whole you know the whole concept of it is a time or, uh, honored artisanal tradition. And I, that's what we were, we're, we're trying to event, uh, you know, defend as best as we can. And the boxes themselves, we were able to, you know, sue the FDA. We were successful in preserving um, the warning labels. Uh, they wanted to basically cover the box with warning labels. And in, in other countries around the world, you have plain packaging where you know, you don't have the, the artisanal box that you save and, um, you know, things like that. So we were successful in that case. The other one, substantial equivalence, uh, which would require premium cigars to undergo a testing regime that's similar to cigarettes. The equipment doesn't even exist, um, you know, for premium cigars, because within a box of cigars, no one cigar is the same. You're going to have different components mm -hmm. and that's the uniqueness of it. So educating policymakers about that and pushing back, suing the FDA when we have to, you know, defending on, on Capitol Hill, as well as in our state legislatures, that's what we're trying to work at, as an association. In addition to, you know, all the other member benefits that we provide, you know, retailers. with. That's awesome. So I was going to say, so, so, one of the things I wanted to ask right away, and maybe this is the one you were going to ask, but go ahead. Uh, uh, I was going to ask something. Were you? I was going to ask something. Ask it. Ask <laughs> it. <laughs> no, no. I mean, um, so overall, and you know, in the United States as a as a whole for tobacco and cigars, is it mostly positive? Like, you know, because sometimes I feel like people, you know, uh, it seems like the cigar industry is kind of taking a downturn when I want it to be in a in a in an upturn, if you will. So, is it mostly good? across the country or is it you know I, I think that there's a couple ways to answer the question um one of which you know surprisingly with covid we have more new cigar stores and new lounges last year than we we lost wow. 1.2 percent of our membership closed permanently due to covid and other financial situations but we've had a net positive gain of new stores they're popping up um you know, a lot of people have more time to enjoy a cigar. Um, they're smoking a little bit more frequently. I know I can speak from, from personal experience, you know, having more time working from home occasionally, I'll, I'll smoke a, a cigar as I'm, I'm drafting memos and things like that. I think a lot of people in the young professional category are, you know, doing a bit of a small cigar boom, uh, which is positive. There is anti-tobacco sentiment um, that I think prevails not only in the United States, but internationally and globally. Um, we're doing as best as we can to fight against some of the misinformation and clumping together premium cigars um, into you know, one category of tobacco. But it's, it's a difficult fight. I think that the vaping issues that we had last year um, and the youth access that paints a negative light on tobacco in general. So, you know, we, we have our work cut out for us, but I think all in all, this this past year, we had more victories than we did defeats. So yeah, that's funny because this is the question that I was going to ask is, 
What were some of those victories that you had in the past year? Like, Kobe and Shaq, bro. I knew you wanted to ask I it. Know, I man. wanted to I wanted <laughs> to ask him the, the more general question, then segue into that. Come and on, Kobe son. and Shaq. Now, who's Kobe and who's Shaq? That's the question. You're bigger than I'm me. Just... <laughs> so you're Shaq, I'm Kobe. <laughs> so, uh, so, the question, so what were some of those victories that you had? Like, What were some of the big hurdles that you overcame? And what were some of those big wins we got last year? So last year we had, you know, at the federal level, I mentioned the court victories. We won both times on warning labels and substantial equivalence with the testing. Mm -hmm. um, we also defeated a lot of tax increases at the state level, Tennessee, Georgia. We're going to see more of those tax increase bills come up. Um, I think, a, a, you know, a, a monumental victory that we had, and it started early last year, and it's being still realized today, is that we have a definition of a premium cigar that's recognized by the courts it's recognized by the food and drug administration so when we go and negotiate with even localities states and the federal government we can say you know you want to address youth access to smoking well youth don't smoke premium cigars the average age of a premium cigar consumer you have your first cigar at the age of 30 that's the average wow. so you know with Stats like that, and that comes from the Food and Drug Administration and the National Institute of Health. That's not an industry-backed study. So taking that, I think we're going to be able to get some carve-outs and, and really have that distinctiveness between premium cigars and all of the other categories of tobacco products. So that's going to be a victory that continues. Um, we also were able to get carve-outs in states like California uh, with anti-tobacco bills, we defeated, um, and it, it didn't pass uh, the U.S. Congress, the Pallone Bill, which will probably resurface this Congress. It would essentially ban branded cutters, lighters, ashtrays. Um, it would ban sponsorship, sponsorship and charitable contributions of cigars um, to nonprofits. It basically would you know, make all tobacco products into what cigarettes and the cigarette companies have to undergo with a master settlement. So that was a significant victory, not you know having that pass Congress last year, because I'm sure you guys are in the same boat as I am. I love my Rocky Patel lighters. I love my Ashton, you know, ashtrays, yeah. like that. And I love the fact that, you know, even us PCA as an association, I can donate cigars to a golf tournament where they're raising money for a scholarship where people can go to college, things like that. So um, those are some big victories and, and the fight still continues. They're not indefinite victories, but um, you know, last year, again, we had more wins than we did losses. Yeah. Cause it, it sounds like, I, and like, I'm no politician, I'm not in politics, but it sounds like they're, they're taking away opportunities from other companies to, you know, to grow and progress. Like, you know, not being able to have branded cutters, lighters, and ashtrays. You know, it, you know, it's capitalism. You know, you want to yeah. be able, you want to be able to make up, you know, make money. So, to me, I'm it's it's kind of, you know, it's like frustrating. It's like they want to take that away from everybody. You know, and it feels like they're and it feels like they're they're attacking something that really they don't know about. But well, not well. <laughs> one, they might not know about it. But but two is is a branded cutter and a branded ashtray really that big of a deal that you need to go after it to prevent it from happening? Yeah. Exactly. Right, like okay, like you said, you can donate cigars to a golf course. That's every cigar they sell, or every or the money that they raise goes to support kids' uh, college tuition. Like that's a good thing. Why would they try to take that away? Yeah, a lot of it doesn't make sense, and that comes back to the education component. I mean, in the your neighbor state of New Jersey, we had a bill well, last session that was introduced that has come back up that would require any. Um, purveyor or seller of tobacco products to sell Nicorette patches or, um, you know, tobacco cessation uh, products. So, but that doesn't make sense. Like, you're because not gonna, there's no nicotine in cigars. This is an addictive product. So, <laughs> like, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get an exemption from, from that for uh, premium cigar outlets and lounges because it will have no effect. You're going to force a business to carry a product that has no effect on their consumer. And I said, you know, when, when I was talking to the bill sponsors and um, some of the folks in the New Jersey legislature, I'm like, are you going to require 
McDonald's to sell treadmills and and and, and booty bands and weights and like <laughs> it doesn't make any damn sense. That's, that's a good, that's a good point. That's yeah, bizarre. That's, that's a good point because yeah, because you're right. It, I think it all goes back to what you're talking about, where you're trying to educate the the legislators and the bill makers about premium cigars. Is a lot of them are making bills about stuff that they don't know about, and they're or they think that they know X when it's really Y. And I think that's what you're you're really trying to do is no, it's not X, it's Y. This is what it's all about. Um, and I think that, like you said, we are getting a lot of wins where once they realize that this is not um, an addictive uh, addictive product, it's not for kids. Kid, you said the average age is 30. I mean, kids aren't – you don't – when kids are going, you see kids there that are chain smoking. They're not chain smoking cigars. Yeah. They're chain smoking cigarettes. They're chain smoking weed. And they're chain smoking uh, uh, vapes. Vapes, e right? all that So stuff. I think that's your point is you're really trying to educate them on what premium cigars actually are so they have a better understanding on how to and make I, the bills or, I, or laws. And I guess that's where you come in because, you know, I'm thinking like why would, legisl- why would legisl- legislation like make laws, put things in place without any having any idea on what to do? You know, that's like me – uh, you know, being a you know being in charge of construction and saying, well, you can't build because X, Y, and Z, and I have no idea anything yeah. about construction. It's like, how does that work? Right. And we're only you know, premium cigars represent 002 percent of the overall tobacco market. We're the smallest player in the game, and we point, have what, what, what was what, that? Point oh two percent. Point oh two. And what, so what is it? What do you mean? What do you mean exactly? You mean by that? So of, of the tobacco industry, when it comes to sales overall, we represent 0.02%. The you know, other tobacco products have the lion's share of the revenue, they have the lion's share of the power. So, you know, we have we have an uphill battle in differentiating ourselves. And a lot of times we're not just fighting the anti-tobacco groups, we're fighting the other players within the tobacco universe. And so you know, you mean like other co- like cigar tobacco companies, like like, uh, cigar- like cigarette companies and oh, like non-premium. Oh, got so, it. You know, I was thinking like you know like Padron and Fuente and stuff like that. So, that's what, that's so what, you're saying like oh, like point oh two like all of the stuff that we smoke, everything, all everything that's on this wall is only 0.02% of all the tobacco sales in the country? Yes. Wow. So that means like 99.99 is like cigarettes is, is what I'm understanding. Cigarette, cigarette and, tobacco. Uh, you know, the, the, the folks that you have, um, you know, boxes on their walls, they work with the PCA. And, you know, there's another organization called Cigar Rights of America, which is a consumer organization. Yep. Uh, and um, th- we all kind of collectively work to advance the industry. But, you know, w- like folks like Fuente, Rocky Patel, George Padron, Al- Alan Rubin from Alec Bradley, um, they're in the fight and in- in advancing our cause significantly. And that's probably the-, the coolest part of the job is being able to work with folks that, you know, I looked up, you know, Red Cigar Aficionado and and, and s- now get to work with them on a daily and weekly basis plus great retailers of you know the different lounges and shops and uh, visiting them and, and hearing their story I tee up legislation and, and inform people about what's going on but if we're going to be successful in advancing things and defeating things it's going to take people that have a vested interest in it and that includes us as consumers as well yeah, so I was, that kind of leads us to one of our other questions: is what, you know, what could people, uh, the consumer, how can that could the consumer help? Like in, us. How could yeah, people like us, you know, people that aren't involved or aren't in, that don't work for PCA, how could people get involved and 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 help fight the fight? Yeah, I, I think you know cigaraction.org. That's a, a good first step. You can sign up to get our emails. Um, it's completely free and um, we'll inform you like in, in New York, there's about four or five bills right now that are problematic. We'll have action alerts ready to go pre-written. All you do takes 30 seconds, put your information in, it gets sent to your elected officials. Um, you know, Cigar Rights of America, our, our sister organization, they are a consumer rights group. Um, they're actively, they have membership so you can pay 
I don't know what it is, 29, 30 bucks. Yeah, I'm, on the, I'm on the emailing list. I get yeah, the emails. I, I, I think I, emails I got one of those free ones when I bought a pack from uh, like a Holt Cigar. I bought like one of those 10 packs and says, get yeah. a free year of cigar rights. Well, they were yeah. at, yeah. Um, they were at uh, before coronavirus in 2019, we went to Cigar uh, Cigar Fest in Pennsylvania and they had a booth there. And yeah. if you signed up for their emailing list, I think they give you a, you know, a cigar. So I still get their emails and they're always talking about the different laws and all the stuff that's happening in, um, yeah. you know, in the cigar industry. Uh, well, those are those are two you know inexpensive resources that um, you know anybody can do. I also think just becoming in, informed and being you know the watchdogs in your area. If you hear something, you see something in the news. Hey, you know, is this going to affect us? You know, there there are, there's about a half dozen people that work on this on a daily basis, and we're here to fight for you. So if you hear something, you know, feel free to reach out to me or or one of your guests or listeners see something that is concerning to them that would inhibit their ability to enjoy a premium cigar. We're here to research it and fight for it and, and advance the industry. I think um, all of us can agree that we want to ensure that this pastime of ours uh, is protected for many years to come. Yeah. I don't want to have to go out and start stocking up on, uh, yeah. on my quote unquote ammunition for smoking cigars. Right. I don't want the, Oh, July 1st, no more cigar. I'm going to be going. I'm going to go to every state in the country and buy as much. You're going to be doing a lot of road trips. Going across the I don't want to have to do that, man. I like this too yeah. damn much. So, uh, quick quick question off cigars. I know you're a big Conor McGregor guy. You know, I, I see you wear the pinstripe suits and everything. You know, what are your thoughts on the fight? You know, how do you feel about your boy? So, I had the, uh, the actual replica of his uh, notorious suit. Uh, yeah. with the uh, profanities on there. And I wore it on Friday. So um, <laughs> That's a great it, suit. That yeah, is a great it's suit, slick, man. It's slick. For all those watching that have, haven't seen that suit, go type in Conor McGregor, fuck you suit, okay? We curse on this podcast. If you don't like it, go okay, watch some I, other I, podcast, okay? But the suit is yeah. pinstripes with fuck yous on it. Crazy. <laughs> so you you actually have... You actually have I yeah I have that the first time I wore it I was presenting at an award ceremony in front of like a thousand people. <laughs> no like, way, I, really? I always wear crazy suits in that. One suit I had it looked like the Hamburglar from McDonald's, <laughs> and uh, I had another one. Um, a good friend of mine is a custom clothier, and uh, we try and do things that are like artwork and like out out there off the wall. So I have one that's like the money in politics one, uh, which is a bit of satire, and it actually has lining with Monopoly money on it. So that's I wore cool. that one year. And then, uh, you know, Cam Newton is certainly another inspiration uh, for, for style. And oh, then yeah. McGregor, of course. So I wore it. Nobody knew. I mean, it, it's so small unless you um, zoom into it, you won't be able to really read what it says. But I was uh, I was pretty disappointed. I had uh, about 10, 10 friends over smoking cigars, watching the fight. We all lost money betting, and uh, you know it was just a uh, overall disappointed. I had gone to the Khabib McGregor fight in Vegas, wow. and that was even more depressing because you travel three thousand miles, <laughs> your fighter loses, and you're supposed to go to the after party at Excess uh, nightclub in Vegas, and it was more of like a wake than, than <laughs> so depressing. Well, listen, I'll, uh, I feel for you because I, I, I had money on McGregor too. He was the last leg in a lot of my parlays. Uh, so that one stung a little bit. My one, my one buddy actually took the opposite. He took, uh, the other dude and yeah. banked well, on it. Well, what's, what's we, what was funny. Well, not funny, but what was interesting is that. So the odds, I almost felt like Vegas kind of, played you a little bit uh, because when you look at the side-by-side -side stats, you know, McGregor hadn't fought in a while and um, uh, Por Pornier or Pornier, <coughs> how do you say his last name? He had, he had taken out a couple of good guys. So the, probably the smarter bet would have been uh, uh, the other guy, Pornier, but being a McGregor guy, but he says, I look like McGregor. I was just going to say, like, Josh, do you think he looks like McGregor? Because people who don't even know him, who are my friends say, yo, you're the, you're the friends with uh, the guy who looks like McGregor, right? And I'm like, you really think he looks like him? <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I, I, I can see it. I, I, I shave my beard, but when I have the, the, the red beard as well, I get a little bit of that look only when I wear sunglasses. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of funny. I, I like his mannerisms. I like what he did for the, the sport. I mean, the UFC wouldn't be what it is today without Conor McGregor. Um, he's entertaining more than anything. Disappointed that he lost. Um, you know, if you talk that big a game, you got to be able to back it up. So hopefully next fight he can rebound. But, um, you know, I think UFC of any of the sports over COVID, um, I've really gravitated towards it because they Same. haven't stopped action. You know, you mm -hmm. take four or five hours on a Saturday, you know, throw a couple parlays down. It's it's great. I, it uh, turns the boring fights into interesting it because it really does. We were watching it beforehand and there was fights coming up and it's like, you know, you got most of your money on the on the horses that you picked. Uh but we have a fight come on and hanging out with my brother-in-law and and um uh, my two brother-in-laws and his dad and everything and we're uh, we're watching it and they're like these two two girls come out and we have no idea about either one of them. And I'm like that I'm like I'm like who do you like? I'm like who do you like? He goes I like the one in the red. I'm like all right. Hundred bucks and a one in the red. Let's like just just to make it interesting. Cause yeah, I'm like, I it. don't give a shit about this fight. I start. We started at six thirty. I gotta wait until twelve thirty to, to to watch the one fight I want to watch. Let me just make this interesting, yeah. okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's just, just not, throw it on. And I wound up winning, so I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> I'm not as much as a betting man, but I, I agree with you. Uh, COVID has definitely attracted me more to UFC than any other, uh, any other sport. I mean, my brothers are huge into it. Yeah, your brother's They're, a big UFC guy. My, my brothers usually get me into the most things that I like. So if I like something, it's probably because my brothers liked it first. But um, I love UFC. I mean, if you got nothing going on a Saturday, especially during COVID, because you really can't go out, yeah. UFC is always there every weekend, regardless if it's a major fight or just you want to watch people bash their heads in. Most people want to see that, and it's always there. Yeah. It's good that, you know, hockey's coming back a little bit. You got fans in the stands and in a couple states, and, you know, I think the Super Bowl um, in Tampa will be interesting. So the, oh, yeah. the sports outlook. You know, Tampa being Cigar City, I'm sure there'll be a lot of interesting party. I'm, I'm not going this year, unfortunately, but, um, you know, it's uh, it, it really is cool. If you guys, I highly recommend going to Tampa and doing kind of the cigar tour, Ybor City. Um, the J.C. Newman factory actually just opened up a cigar museum, there, um, wow. which is really you can do the pairings. It's really like the Disneyland of um, so for cigar cigars museums in Tampa. That's so yeah. it's so funny because uh, that you said cigar museum because uh, I'm getting married in November and my brothers are planning uh, are planning my bachelor party and they're like bro your bachelor party and Justin's gonna be going there and they're like bro it's gonna be so sick it's so Eric it's Eric and I'm like I only like a few things I like like and I'm telling I'm telling my fiance, I know where it is. <laughs> of course you do but I'm telling my fiance and she's like it's so Eric like is there a cigar museum that you're going to like you like cigars and golf and I'm like I don't think there's a cigar museum so I don't think I'm doing that but apparently there is now in Tampa yeah no they, they it's it's great the other city that I've been to that has such a really unique cigar culture is Atlanta um, you know, you can go to Cam Newton's Fellowship Cigar Lounge that plays like live jazz music, you know, right near the stadium and then just other little shops here and there. Rocky Patel has a burn there. Um, so I those wish. are the two yeah. cities that have like, you know, a cigar culture where you can really make a full day out of just going to different spots. I, 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 it, it hurts me to hear you say that because I lived in Atlanta for like five months and uh, I unfortunately got really into cigars when I moved out of Atlanta. Um, but I always hear good things about Atlanta and cigars because I was I was down there. I was doing Buckhead. I was doing downtown Atlanta. I was all over there. So if I was who I am today and I lived in Atlanta for what I was doing, I would have been I would have oh, been all over. Oh yeah. It hurts. Yeah. Anytime well, I like mean, cigars in Atlanta, I'm like, oh, I mean, God. we aside from Atlanta, I mean, we were 45 minutes from New York City, which has got. A ton. I'm sure you've been to New York City. It's got a ton of cigar cigar bars, but unfortunately, when COVID hit, everything in the city shut yeah. down. So, but we do have a good a good group yeah. of cigar lounges. Have you ever been to the Carnegie Club? I have. I, that is an amazing spot. And then you got Grand Havana Room there, and I love Lexington Books. Yes, that to me. You know, going in there watching James Bond, the way you enter the place, you feel like you're in a mafia movie. Yeah, I mean. It, 
it is a blast. I, when I went to New York City, I was doing a couple meetings with elected officials there, and we did a little bit of a New York City cigar tour, and Lexington Books was on the list, and I kept one of the matches, and on the train back to D.C., I'm like, Prague, Prague. They have another location in Prague. So I went and on the train booked a trip to Prague and went to the Lexington book, Books uh, <laughs> for a long weekend in Prague, which was equally as cool wow. um, you know, in, in another country. Uh, but I was devastated this past year with the closing of Nat Sherman. That was probably mm. my favorite spot. Oh, man, it's so it's so unfortunate. We've, yeah. we've been there. I mean, it's right outside Grand Central. It's like the staple in New York City. The entrance is just beautiful. Yeah, even if you don't like cigars, you just want to go in because the outside was so appealing with the clock and the and the uh, and the Indian holding the clocks up. I mean, it was just like a grand Grand Central, and you had like, like the grand cigar like stru- yeah, yeah. Uh, structure right there. It was it's really unfortunate because um, uh, I was my last time I was in there was right before coronavirus. I was in there like last year in January, and it it just hurts. Yeah, it hurts. it's very unfortunate. So so let me ask this. So you said you went to you went to Prague to go to this Lexington, um, and I think Lexington Bar and Books also has Hudson Bar and Books. Uh, as well, right? Because I've been to the Hudson one too, and I don't think it's as 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 lavish as Lexington one is. But so you've been to Prague. What other places outside of the country would you say? I mean, you've been to Nicaragua, and we're my, that might be where the, your answer to this question. But what are some of the other places outside of the country that really stand out that you've been to? That you went to either a lounge or you went to a tobacco farm? You know, what are some of those places? Yeah, you know, I think the big three are Honduras, Nicaragua, and the DR. Um, also, you know, there's you can smoke in next to any location in any of those spots. I think that's what the beauty of it is. You know, in the United States, it's hit or miss. Like you go to a hotel, you're on a beach. Well, and even in Florida, which I think Florida has an amazing cigar culture, not just Tampa and Miami, but you can go all along the coast. There's lounge after lounge you know, place after place. But there was a bill introduced this week that would ban smoking on public beaches and public parks. And we're fighting back uh, uh, on this. Um, We had one of our uh, board of directors testify at the committee hearing this week about it. Because I I love going to Miami and and, and Tampa and, and any of those spots, Naples, Florida, having a cigar on the beach, you know, having a having a cocktail. I'm better. Miami, like there's nothing better to do than walk around and smoke a cigar. You can, yeah, you got smoke. the you got the floral button down, the the silk button down. You got the fedora, the you got hat. You can't forget cigar about the in hat. your mouth. I mean, come on, man, it's like it's a vibe down there. You can't like, forget how, about the hat. Come on, it's when I was I went to the Key West. I was in Miami, and then I drove down to the Key West, and I went into a little little clothing shop in Miami. I bought a fedora, and I, I was just like living. I just felt like I was living life. I was walking like Scarface in his I convertible. Was, bro, <laughs> I was in the, I was smoking a cigar, having my you know tank top or button down with that fedora on. Then I was in the convertible. I'm like, who? Chichi, get the yayo. Yo, come on. It was, it's so good. So the fact that you just said that, it hurt. You know, I hope it. I hope that doesn't happen. But that so, would be tr- yeah. that would be devastating. So it, any any of the you know places that have good smoking laws where you're allowed to enjoy cigars in a lot of different places i love any venue that you can eat a good meal whether it's pasta yes. or steak and yes. smoke a cigar while you're eating oh. or afterwards have a little cognac or uh, a port as a, a dessert with a, a cigar um you know this trip this recent trip to nicaragua was eye-opening i got to go to jalapa i got to go to esteli managua pretty much all over. And um, I had the opportunity to meet with the Nicaraguan Chamber of Tobacco, uh, which was really cool. And they gave me this like hand painted cigar box. And in it had, you know, 20 different cigars from 20 different companies that are their members based in Nicaragua. And that's something that is like a a trinket that I will cherish, um, you know, for the rest of my life. But the, um, you know, venues there, the, the restaurants, and then just being able to go to a factory or a farm and enjoy a cigar, that is a really cool experience too. I visited seven factories while I was there this trip and um, three farms. And, um, you know, each, each one was different and I learned a lot about it. 
um, had the opportunity to meet with um, the, the folks at Oliva. They have such a sophisticated operation, uh, Perdomo, Aganorsta, um, and the Placencia farm. I, I think uh, my go-to smokes are usually Padron, Tatawahe, Placencia, Ace Prime, and then uh, it used to be Nat Sherman, and, and now with um, Michael Herklotz relaunching the Timeless and Metropolitan brands at his, his new company, I will likely gravitate to those as well. So when so, let's ask you this because we like to ask this because the stories are always different. When how did you get into cigars? What was you know what was the first? How old were you when you first yeah. had your first cigar? How'd you get into it? Was there a special story? Do you remember your first cigar? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely do. It was a Rocky Patel cigar. Um, I was 18 and um, 18 or 19. And it was my professor of political science that got me into cigars. He would have a, a, a Churchill Society meeting, uh, Winston Churchill, where people would just come together, smoke cigars every Friday and talk politics, talk current affairs. And um, it really solidified. There was also a course at, uh, I went to Washington and Jefferson College outside of Pittsburgh. And um, there, there was this course where you'd study Mexican and Caribbean politics, three weeks in classroom, and then a week as a cruise where we, you would go to those countries. And that week, otherwise known as the booze cruise, that's where I developed my love of tequila and cigars uh, fully. So. <laughs> That, that was, uh, you know, a great story. And I still talk to that professor. Um, and now it's like, you know, you gave me your first Rocky Patel, that Rocky Patel cigar. And now I text him photos of myself with Rocky Patel at events. <laughs> so, your, so your professor would hold after class meetings, smoking cigars and kind of just BSing, like basically what every cigar smoker does. Yes. Yeah. Wow. That's so so you had mentioned That's Rocky, but you had mentioned Rocky Patel. So I don't know if you see this little gem right here in the corner. Um, but this is uh people can see on the camera. I don't know if you can you see this right here? I can see it, yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, the Rocky Patel, um, the old world reserve when we met him in uh, Cigar Fest and yeah. he signed a box for us. So we got this one up right here. We lit, yeah, um, we, he invited us behind the table. We lit up his cigar. I think you poured him a glass of bourbon. Yeah, so it was funny because we were at Cigar Fest and we were, you know, we asking, hey, you know, can we, can we have a picture or whatever? So he, yeah, he invited us back. We were hanging out with him. And he's like, he's, you know, doing all these things, signing all these, boxes, signing about whatever. And he's got a cigar in his hand, but the cigar's not lit. He's got no drink. The cigar's not lit. And he's running around, running around. And then uh, people, he's trying to shake hands, shake hands. So I, I stop him. I go, hold on, hold up. And everybody's like, what the hell is this kid doing? What's this guy I'm like, doing? stop. I go, Rocky, here. He, I was like, I pull out my lighter. I was like, here. I light up his cigar, <laughs> pour him a drink. I go, here. He's like, thank you. <laughs> go, you're doing all this stuff, and you're not even smoking a drink. And I'm like, stop, stop. Everyone else, is like, everyone else is like, Rocky, you got to smoke a cigar, Rocky. And Justin's like, hold up. <laughs> it was classic. He was very nice guy. Very nice guy. Very good guy. Very, very, very good great guy. advocate for the industry. And he does a lot of work here in DC, um, you know, with the lawsuits. He was a, a, a lawyer um, and, and also just meeting with members of Congress, the administration. Um, he's a, a true believer in the, the industry and somebody that is willing to invest his time and resources into it. I have the utmost respect for Rocky. And, um, you know, he's one of the folks that I'm really glad to have met um, because, you know, you, you read the news stories and you see the cigar aficionado articles and the blogs and that, but, you know, having the opportunity to have a scotch with him after we, you know, are on the hill all day, that to me is the real benefit of the job is like, you know, I'm blessed to be in this position and I, I don't take it lightly. I want to make sure that in our programs and our, our government relations work, we are achieving our goals and, and doing what's necessary to defend the industry. And then, you know, we get to enjoy some of the benefits of it afterwards. So where do you see, where do you see the cigar market going? Like earlier you said, um, you know, the average age for a cigar smoker is 30. And then earlier you said, you know, a, po a podcast like this is like what we're advocating for for the younger cigar smokers. Do you see like the cigar smoker getting younger? Do you see it going in a different direction? Like, what's your opinion on it? 
Yeah, you know, I think it's going to go, um, you're going to see more younger professionals um, enjoy cigars. It's much like craft beer, craft whiskey, mm. you know, a fine wine. These are luxury products that, you know, a lot of folks might not enjoy on a daily basis, but every Friday after work, they're going to get together with their friends. They're going to go to a new lounge. Um, I see that growing. The largest growing market um, for cigar enthusiasts is actually African-American women. So um, really? I, I okay. think that, that trend will, will continue. You're seeing, you know, new consumers as a result of having more time um, due to COVID and being home. Um, so I, I think it's going to grow, you know, in terms of younger consumers, I think that, you know, that, that 20, the 21 mark, obviously, you know, last year, the age of purchase was raised from 18 to 21. Um, that for us, it, it really didn't matter in terms of our, our general consumer. Um, and the only issue is you have a lot of folks in the military that do enjoy premium cigars. Yeah. So we took a stance and said, you know, this isn't right. If you can serve your country, if you can vote, you know, why do you have to wait till till 21 to, to purchase it? Um, Suffolk County in New York is actually trying to raise the age of purchase from 21 to 25. So we wow. have a long line in the sand. You know, they raised it to 21. You know, we get it for the other products like vaping and, e, you know, e-cigarettes and cigarettes. You don't want the kids play, playing on the playground, puffing on cigarettes or vape products. But we don't have that issue here. They're younger, younger adults that enjoy premium cigars occasionally, recreationally. You know, that average cigar consumer also sm smokes 1.2 cigars a month on average. So this isn't a chain smoking product. Um, I do joke because we're probably outliers in that <laughs> statistic. Um, but then again, this is our passion. So um, I do think that you're going to have a robust young professional class of people that will continue to enjoy cigars and get people excited about it. Much like, you know, you go on a brewery tour or a whiskey tour. Um, I, I think that that's a good parallel of industries and where the growth is. Yeah, I like how you say you you continue to say that it's young professionals that uh, you might see coming up up the the ranks with cigars because we want to make it clear that this is not when we say young uh, young folks or when Eric was saying young folks we're not talking about 15 16 year old kids we're talking about those kids that are 21 mm -hmm. 22 23 they're out of college into a job um, or if they didn't go to college or in the working industry for a couple of years now and like you said young professionals that are looking for that little bit of luxury, um, but maybe not smoke every single day. One once a month, you know. I always said that you know maybe once a week, like you said, every Friday you want to go into the lounge, yeah. you want to celebrate a good week. You can pour yourself a scotch, pour yourself a bourbon, have a cocktail, smoke a cigar. Um, and I'm, I agree with you where if you can serve for your country at 18 and you can vote, you're technically considered uh, an adult in the eyes of the law at 18. Why can't you have a cigar? Why can't I, I? I believe why can't you have a beer? If you can fight for your country, why can't you have a beer? Why can't you? Line. Why can't you smoke a cigar? Um, but I mean, like you said, when they raise it to twenty one, it wasn't really that big of a deal for the cigar industry because people from eighteen to twenty one aren't really buying cigars. Yeah, you, I don't think yeah, most they, kids think. I don't even think they even think of cigar. I mean, I. I mean, Justin and I. I'm sure yourself. I, we grew up around it, so. Um, but even then, even growing up around it all the time in college, I never, you know, every once in a while, I just did it as a joke to be like, Hey, look at me. I got a cigar. <laughs> I'm yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't until I moved into Connecticut and went to Cigar Fest that I, I was 25 ish. That's when I really got into it. That's when yeah. I really took a deep dive into cigars. And you know, it, it's cost prohibitive too. Like you're not going to be able to afford as, as a younger person you know, to have cigars all the time. And I think you kind of grow into it. Um, one of the things that we have to face as an industry and as consumers is to kind of um, counterbalance that whole stereotype about cigar smokers that they're, you know, old fat guy with the top hat. Like that's <laughs> not your average cigar smoker. I mean, it, 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 it cigars, transcend socioeconomic classes, race, religion, political affiliation. Um, 
my best conversations, even before having this job, were over a cigar. Mm, you know, it might absolutely. Have, I mean, business discussions, all of the above. Like it, the the meaningfulness of this, it relaxes folks to the extent where you know some of the top, as you guys know, and we we don't get into partisan politics at PCA. We're we're the party of cigars, not Republican, not Democrat. But whenever you have those tough partisan conversations, a lot of times I have them in cigar lounges where we're all relaxed. We have civil conversations and we get people from all different walks of life that can, you know, respectfully have a conversation about tough issues. So I enjoy that. Um, and that that's something worth defending. And, and we got to go out there and spread the word. And, and that's why I'm a huge advocate for cigar media, for the podcast like this because you tell the different stories, you know, sometimes you might have a celebrity on there. Sometimes you might have someone like me on there and, and, and women, men, different backgrounds. That's important to tell those stories. Yeah. And that's like the one thing that we really, and we talk about all the time is that is the whole point of this. And what we're trying to do is that cigars are a way to relax you can have a conversation and just like we're doing right now this is just because you're in dc and we're here in 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 new york it's like we're in a lounge we're just having a conversation relaxing it's been a a rough week or a rough day whatever it is but we talk about all times all different walks of life we had them all from from singers to athletes to to you that's in the government side of it government related to military to just us talking like you name it we've had them on here and every episode has been great that conversation been great. And like you said, it's all been neutral. We haven't talked about anything negative. We haven't talked about any gossip. It's all just good conversation um, all over a cigar and, and a drink. Sounds like, you know, political debate should be in a cigar lounge. Just <laughs> smoking a cigar. I mean, that's what, it yeah. so- that's what it sounds like. For sure. You know, like, you know, who... Uh, who wants to get angry and mad when they're smoking a cigar? I don't know. You, know, you, you can't. I don't think you can. I don't, I, I I don't think, think you can. There should be a study cigar. about it. <laughs> there's a, something in the cigar that like, you know, reverses the adrenaline or something, you know, about getting mad, you know. so We got to get on that research, you know, make make sure that everybody knows that. Yeah, let's get it. I'll be, I'll be a part of it. I'll be happy to, I'll be happy to do that research. For sure. We so, definitely, we got to have you guys come to uh, DC at some point to our, our offices here. And then of course our, our big trade show. Um, Most definitely. You know, the, the trade show is a, a great time. I, I think when I was there uh, two years ago, of course, last year it was canceled. But two years ago, within the six or seven day time frame, I had eighty four cigars. Yeah, uh, yeah, trying, buddy. Bringing out new, di- you know, different things, and um, I mean, it's a blast. It's the who's who of the cigar industry, and um, you kind of it, it really is the Super Bowl of, of the cigar industry. So did you did you not smoke for like a week after that because your lungs? <laughs> yeah, how did your how did how, how did your mouth feel? I don't know if you have a wife or a girlfriend or whoever, yeah. but you know how. <laughs> Took a little bit of a reprieve after that. I, uh, you know, you have to take a break in moderation. But, you know, for me, like, I'll, I'll have one or two a day, um, and I like trying new things. Whenever I go to a cigar shop, I will get three cigars on average. One is whatever is local to the shop because they a lot of times will have private, you know, private mm-hmm. label cigars or even some of the factory throwaways um, that you know five bucks it's on you know doesn't have a band um i will do a tried and true so one of those brands that i mentioned that i really enjoy and then uh whatever's new on the market i i will try any cigar one time um and uh you know you want to build kind of an understanding and i'm sure you guys are in the the same boat running a a a podcast like this you want to be able to talk intelligently about all the different products. And I don't want to ever be put in a position where it's like, Oh, did you, did you try this cigar and, and um, ask questions about it? You know, chances are I've tried the cigar um, in, in, in most cases. So yeah. what, are, what are some of uh, uh, like the more boutique brands or the newest cigars that you tried that you liked? I love Roma craft. I love foundation, which, you know, you're, you're smoking one now. Um, I think that those guys are doing really cool stuff. Uh, a good friend, Steve Zangle, um, does a, a neat cigar, uh, partners with Aganorsa. Um, it's called Los Cayados. They donate a, um, a dollar from every cigar to either firefighters or 
police officers. Nice. Um, so that's a, a really cool concept. I like to support them uh, whenever I can. And then um, if you ever go to a pl in Chicago, uh, Up Down Cigars, uh, Phil Ledbetter, who's one of our board members, a great knowledgeable resource. When I was first getting started, you know, he, Alan Rubin from Alec Bradley, and then Luciano, of course, really taught me a lot um, coming into it. But Phil does a private label of, of tatuajes for um, Mardi Gras, and it's called a queen beefcake. If you like strong, earthy cigars, <laughs> highly recommend it. All the right. Queen Beefcake. Queen Beefcake. That's a name you'll there never you forget. Go. That's like the Raging Bitch. You want a Queen <laughs> Beefcake. That's the Raging Bitch beer that we like to drink. But um, oh, oh, I was just going to say, uh, what the heck was it? I just had it on my mind and we were just thinking about it. But go on. I, I, I lost it. So <laughs> No, I like because we do the same thing. I like to try. Uh, I like to try cigars. And what I like to do is if I have a cigar that if I try it and it really just – it doesn't it's it's not like it's if it's just really bad and it has a really off flavor to it i might give it a little bit and come back maybe a month or so later and try the cigar again because you know, like you said every cigar in a box is not the same and the box maybe it it wasn't transported properly maybe the humidity wasn't kept up maybe, yeah. maybe it was just a bad batch like there could be some or maybe it was something i ate i didn't have any food something like that there could be other uh, circumstances that led me to not like the cigar. So I'll try it again at a later point. And then if I don't like it again, I'm like, all right, I gave it two shots and I really don't like it. So I know that I won't, but I like doing that, trying just almost putting the blindfolds on and just, and, and picking one off the shelf and being like, all right, it's the one I'm smoking today. I mean, we are in the works of creating our own cigars. So you best believe we got to send a few down to you so you can try mm -hmm. it and let us know what you think. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll reciprocate with the, the the thing that the project that I'm working on, you know, I, I, I became a fan of your podcast when I saw the coffee and cigars one. I'm a big coffee enthusiast. Um, again, that's another thing. What goes together grows together. Yes. yes. That's our favorite parent. And, yes. And it's, um, I, that's my beverage of choice in most most instances, and I thought that was a great episode where you you guys educated a lot of folks about the pairings. But that does have an impact what you have with it, um, whether it's food or beverage, and then also the environment. I know that when I'm indoors, I prefer certain cigars versus when I'm outdoors, um, and and that's something that I didn't realize early on. It was kind of oh, a cigar is a cigar is a cigar. And that really isn't the case. You, you, the conditions and even who you're with, who you're enjoying a cigar with matters. Um, and uh, so taking in consideration all of those factors, to me, it's important. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, what do they say? A, a cigar is as good as the memories you have when you smoked it, exactly. right? It's all about who who's with there, who's who you're with too. Or and and sometimes it may not even be who you're with, but like you said, what you're doing. You know, because I've had some cigars where, all right, you can smoke a cigar and let's let's compare two different scenarios. The same cigar, you could be on the golf course with buddies. You're just drinking beers. You're just hacking the weeds, whatever. You know, <laughs> having a good time. Typically, versus you're sitting. I'll be sitting here. I'll be listening to music, watching TV or something. or reading a book, having a, a, a scotch or a bourbon, and I'm smoking the same cigar. I might enjoy it more by myself because I can pick up more of the flavors mm -hmm. and I'm more in tune with the cigar than if I was out just smoking it to smoke it because I'm on the course. You know what I'm saying? Oh, definitely. Well, we see here. Well, I don't know if you have anything else. I don't. I was going to send it <laughs> yeah, off. Yeah, we're going to we're kind of coming to the close of here, but um. Typically, at the end, when we do have a guest, we kind of just want to uh, give you the red carpet, kind of just let you uh, plug all your your social media outlets where people can find you online, what they can do to make a difference. So please let us know, and uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, guys. I really appreciate all the work that you do and advancing the cause. Um, I appreciate having the platform to come on and, and have some fun with you guys today. Um, you know, you can follow us, PCA, Premium Cigar Association, 1933, uh, on, you know, Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. You know, personally, I'm on Instagram as the Wolf of K Street, um, which uh, it, it, it's it's another funny satire thing. I, I try to be a character. I don't want to be the, the boring suit in D.C. So that's um, good. We like that. Like to have fun with it and um you know as i mentioned cigar action 
good resource for folks to learn a little bit more. Uh, we've been doing interactive uh, videos on Facebook in particular recently. So we have a, a treasure trove of interviews with major manufacturers. Um, when I was in Nicaragua, we did a full factory tour, uh, which is on there, um, kind of opening up the transparency of the industry so people can see the behind the scenes of how it can happen. And we're going to continue to do that. So um, really, really appreciate again, uh, your time and all that you guys do to help support premium cigars. Well, Josh, we thank you for your time for being on the Burn Down Podcast. Yeah, um, and and like Josh said, you can follow him on all of those. The links will be down below as well. Um, reach out, follow him on Instagram, and, and support the cause. Because we sure love smoking cigars. I know Josh sure loves smoking cigars, and we don't want to ever get rid of it. So. We're going to keep fighting the fight. Keep fighting the fight. So with that, yep. Josh, thank you very much for your time. And we're going to send it off. Take care. And Cheers, stay smoky. Guys. Salute, my friend. Appreciate you. Cheers.